Hi, folks. I'm so glad to, that you joined us here at the summit, and I am thrilled to be presenting to you. I'm going to share my screen right away so we can jump right in. And we're going to be talking about anxiety, neurodiversity, and college. So I'm Dr. Eric Andlick, and I am the founder of Top College Consultants. Um, I'd like to start with this this sentiment that uh, your development has to go at its own pace. It just doesn't happen to be the usual pace. I think that really applies to uh, a lot of students, and I, I think it's a nice uh, thought. So um, top college consultants, we work with students around the world, helping them select colleges, apply to colleges, figure out what kind of support they need, apply to gap year programs, summer programs, so all the tasks associated with the application process and uh, including financial aid. And just to be clear, you know, I, I realize uh, a lot of you folks may be in various countries. I'm the, in the U.S. and uh, we tend to use the terms college and university interchangeably. I know in other countries it's often uh, referred to as university. So if you hear me use the term college a lot, I, it's what you uh, probably think of as university. And uh, also my expertise is primarily with U.S.-based colleges, so uh, a lot of what I'll be saying um, comes from that awareness and that knowledge. So um, these are the folks on my team. Um, we are scattered around the country and we have different areas of expertise. So uh, Alicia Paul has worked with international students, students applying to grad school. Um, Jamie Becker has a lot of experience with student athletes. Um, Jenny and Lisa are California-based, know a lot about the California uh, system. Melanie has um, worked with a lot of transfer students. So between all of us, we, we cover a lot of ground and we work as a team. So students benefit from our collective expertise. Um, if you're not already in our Facebook group, I encourage you to join. Uh, it says here over 12,000 members. By the time you see this, uh, it might be up to 13,000. And it's parents of college-bound students with learning disabilities, ADHD, and ASD. I know that's a mouthful, um, but it's a great place for parents to share resources, ask questions. How did you deal with this? Have you had an experience with this university? Uh, it's a really good, good place for parents to support each other and learn from each other. Um, so uh, what are some of the some of the challenges that our neurodivergent students have when applying to college? Um, first of all, you know, figuring out which colleges to apply to in the first place uh, is a big challenge. <clears throat> in the U.S., we have uh, 4,000 colleges, so um, that can be a bit overwhelming. And kind of understanding what are the different options, community college, public university, private um, uh, you know, postgraduate program, gap year programs, college readiness programs, so many different things to, to sort through. Also kind of figuring out what kind of support uh, the student needs. So that could be support in areas of social functioning, could be independent living, like, you know, self-care, uh, could be executive functioning, organizing, time management. Um, students need different kinds of support. We try to figure out what they need and, and where they can best get that. And, uh, you know, students are not always 100% comfortable accepting the help for those uh, needs. So kind of working through that over the course of multiple um, <clears throat> sessions can be helpful to get students to be on board with getting the kind of help they need in college. Writing essays can be really overwhelming for a lot of our students. The essays involved in the application process are very different from the essays they're used to writing in high school. Um, and we help them work through that anxiety and organize their thoughts and write effective essays. Um, many of our students have kind of unusual paths through high school. They may have changed schools. They may have, issue, have issues with grades at a certain point or taking a leave of absence. So we kind of help them figure out how to address that and talk about that in their application. Uh, figuring out whether to disclose their diagnosis, so autism, ADHD, whatever it may be, do they talk about it in the application process? When do they talk about it? How do they talk about it? Uh, we, we help students think that through too. In fact, I'm giving a whole talk on disclosure at another conference this fall. Um, standardized testing, whether to take the standardized test, which ones, whether to submit the scores, and uh, kind of understanding the difference between the requirements at different colleges is another 
thing that comes up. And of course, meeting deadlines, which uh, can be a big challenge. And I surveyed uh, 50 parents of neurodivergent students, many of them from our Facebook group. And um, what they said really kind of confirms what I said in the last slide. Uh, <clears throat> one of the top concerns, the top concern really was uh, finding the disability support in college. Uh, and then after that, writing essays, selecting colleges, managing their time, and the amount of work involved in the whole college application process, which unfortunately in the U.S. is pretty complex. Uh, what about adjusting to college? Um, so the challenges of adjusting to college. And all this, of course, can be very stressful. I should have said back uh, about college application, a recent survey showed in the U.S. that that it's the number one, the, the application process is the number one academic stressor that students report during high school, uh, which is really unfortunate, but that is the reality. Um, but even once they've applied, then there are all kinds of challenges involved in the adjustment and when they start college, making friends, getting along with roommates, again, dealing with it, whatever needs they might have for support, uh, accessing those uh, services and accommodations. If they have sensory sensitivity to sound, smells, uh, living with a roommate, eating in the dining hall can be challenging. Um, of course, mental health more than ever before. We're seeing um, issues with, with so many of our students. Time management, um, <clears throat> we'll come back to this, you know, meeting deadlines, organizing their time, uh, managing money, uh, taking care of themselves, um, taking care of their health, and just kind of staying focused and staying on track. Again, surveyed parents. 50 parents, these were the top concerns that parents cited. Keeping up with the workload, making friends, being asked, able to ask for help, maintaining their mental health, and time management. Very similar to the list that I came up with on my own before I surveyed parents. So what are the skills that students need to be successful in college? Um, I break them down into three main areas. Self-awareness, that means kind of understanding what are you good at? What do you, when do you need help? What kinds of things do you need help with? Um, self-advocacy, that's kind of speaking up, stepping forward when you do need help and, and asking for it, finding the resources you need, scheduling your own appointments, um, pursuing whatever support you need. Uh, and we will, you know, talk about what some of those things might be. And then uh, self-management, managing your emotional reactions, managing your time, managing your level of motivation so that you can last through four years of college, which is what it typically is minimum. Uh, to get a bachelor's in the U.S. Uh, so staying motivated, getting through the semester, doing all the studying you need to do. So how does college differ from high school? Well, you know, if you're on the call and you um, went to college or university yourself, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm just going to highlight a few key differences. Again, this is particularly applicable to the U.S. In high school, students tend to spend many hours in class. In college, it's much fewer hours. In high school, there's many, there's not that many hours of homework, relatively speaking, um, whereas the, the assignments in college may be much more extensive, much longer papers, more pages of reading, and so on. So it's kind of a reverse. Uh, in college, it's fewer hours in class, but more time outside of class doing the work that needs to be done. Uh, by the same token, in high school, because the, the day is so long, uh, students' schedules tend to be very structured. And then after school, if they have band practice or sports practice or test prep or tutoring, their whole day ends up being very structured. In college, you may have entire days with nothing scheduled that you as the student have to figure out how to uh, uh, structure. In high school uh, in the U.S., there's a lot of supports in place for students who are on special education plans. They're called 504 plans or IEPs, depending on, on the student's needs. And um, a lot of those supports just kind of happen automatically. The student shows up at school and those supports are delivered. In college, the burden is on the student to pursue and access those services and accommodations. So very different model where the student is not going to get the support unless they step up and ask for it, which goes back to why self-advocacy is so important. And then finally, in high school, the law that uh, applies to special education is, is the IDEA, and that focuses on students being successful, making effective progress. Whereas in college, the law that applies, it's same same law that applies in the workplace in the US, the Americans with Disabilities Act, that emphasizes access, access to um, 
to education. It does not, uh, there's no requirement that the college ensure that the, the students be successful. That's on the student. So how do you know if your student is ready for college or university? Well, college capable, if the student is in high school, taking challenging courses in the US, we, you know, it could be honors classes, accelerated, IB, AP, uh, you know, challenging courses, dual enrollment at a community college, and they are doing well, getting A's or B's, or in the 90s, if, they, if they're on a, uh, that numbered system for grades, then they're probably going to be okay with college level academics. They're probably capable, college capable. But college ready means that they're ready to handle the independence of living away from home and managing all the things we briefly touched on earlier. So for college readiness, students need to be able to independently identify when they need help, independently seek out help, seek out the appropriate services, even if they run into obstacles, like someone not returning their email or phone call, and then independently apply those supports once they've accessed them. So if they meet with a tutor or a counselor or what have you, they need to apply what they've learned in order to be successful. So now let's move on to the emotional um, sphere. What about emotional readiness in particular, mental health readiness, so to speak? Um, I think of it this way. Number one, you need to know what your vulnerability is. When you are in distress, do you tend to um, develop depression, anxiety, addictive patterns, eating dis disordered eating? Uh, what are what are your characteristic reactions under stress? Do you tend to withdraw and so on? Uh, secondly, what are the red flags or the signs that that is starting to take place? So for example, if you've had depression in the past um, and, and it's starting to come back, maybe you've noticed, oh, I'm not responding to my friend's texts. I'm, I've stopped going to class. I'm, I'm not eating. I'm not, I'm staying up late or I'm sleeping late. Uh, what are the signs to you that, that that issue is starting to rear its ugly head again? Thirdly, what are the strategies you can use when those conditions recur? So you want to have kind of in your back pocket, so to speak, a list. You know, you can literally have a, you know, a, a list on the little card or, or on your phone or what have you of your strategies that are tried and true that have worked for you in the past. Maybe that's going back to the gym. Maybe that's, uh, you know, petting a cat or dog, maybe that is going for a walk in nature, reading a book, listening to music, whatever it is, you wanna have a list of those things. Maybe it's going back on medication. Uh, and then you need to know in college, where can you get more help if needed? If what you're doing doesn't work, what's the next step? If you've tried exercising and listening to music and hanging out with your friends and you're still depressed or anxious or whatever your uh, condition is that you struggle with, What's the next step? And you, that's why you really need to know the resources in college ahead of time so that you can access them when the time comes. Um, let's step back a bit and talk about anxiety, which unfortunately is plaguing a just a record number of teens these days. Um, so anxiety as a feeling is part of the norm, normal range of emotions, right? We all get anxious on occasion. So um, that's having the feeling of anxiety is is normal on occasion. It's having it in a, a chronic and a um, disabling way that is of concern. An anxiety disorder where it's causing you ongoing, consistent distress over time or getting in interfering with, with your daily functioning at school or work and relationships. Um, now it's different from fear, right? Fear is a response to imminent danger. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, if you think you're being robbed or if you know if your house is on fire you're and you're in imminent danger you've got to run out of the house because it's it's on fire fear is, is an appropriate adaptive response that's built into us through evolution uh, anxiety is more like a false alarm it has a lot of the same physiological sensations as as fear you know your heart rate going rapidly uh potentially sweating stomach upset um breathing more rapidly and shallowly um, but it tends to be a false alarm, it tends to be a response to your thoughts, not to an imminent danger that is happening right now. So it could be like, well, what if, what if I don't do well on the test and then I, then I looks like I'm going to fail the class or I'm not going to be able to get into college? What if this person that I like uh, doesn't want to go, uh, doesn't want to be friends with me or date me? Um, so those worries about, about hypothetical situations that haven't even happened yet that cause your body to have that fear-like response. 
Anxiety appears, uh, impairs decision-making. So as one of my friends used to say, anxiety makes you stupid. Um, it When your body is revved up, the frontal lobe, the part of your brain that's involved in judgment and decisions and so on doesn't work very well. So obviously don't make any Im really important decisions when you're in a high level of anxiety. Um, and you need to calm yourself down in order to kind of take appropriate steps to address uh, a concern, to even figure out if there is a real concern. And, that, and I like to break anxiety down into thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So the thoughts are the worries, right? I was describing those before. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, <clears throat> the feelings are the, the bodily sensations. Again, your heart racing, your stomach being in knots, your palms being sweaty, uh, feeling lightheaded or dizzy or nauseous. Uh, and then thirdly are the behaviors. That's how, kind of how you respond or what do you do when you're anxious. Um, and that could be avoidance, for example. That could be a, you know, staying away from the thing that's stressing you out. Well, I'm worried I'm not going to do well on the uh, on the math assignment, so I'm just going to avoid doing it. Uh, I'm just going to not think about it right now. Or it could be, um, could be again, so it's one of those maladaptive responses. We're going to get into those uh, shortly. There's a lot of different types of anxiety disorders. I'm not going to go into any great detail. Uh, panic disorder is when you have frequent panic attacks. Those are intense, sudden bouts of anxiety uh, that are absolutely terrifying. It tend to be, you know, over a short duration, maybe 30 minutes or less. Um, sometimes they are kind of out of the blue. And then over time, if you have them over and over again, uh, you may develop agoraphobia where you're avoiding things because you think you're going to get anxious in that situation. Like the most extreme version was somebody who doesn't go out of the house at all because they're afraid they're going to have a panic attack when they leave the house. Um, and then there's specific phobias. That's something that is very typical in childhood, some sort of childhood fear of the, the dark, of dogs, of, um, you know, thunder, loud noises, um, you name it. Um, many of these spiders, snakes, rats, many of these kind of die down after childhood, but not always. Um, and they're, they're actually quite easy, relatively easy to treat. OCD, lots of people may have become familiar with this, you know, through the media. And um, that's where you have obsessions and or compulsions. Frequently they go hand in hand. Obsessions being unwanted thoughts that are disturbing to you, like thoughts of something violent uh, that, that bother you to have those thoughts. And, and But they they seem to come even when you don't want them to, to come. And then the compulsions are things that people do frequently to address or or hopefully, you know, reduce the obsessions or the anxiety. Uh, you know, hand washing is the kind of classic symptom that people are probably familiar with in response to fear of cont contamination. Of course, with the pandemic, that became much more of a, of a gray area. Um, unfortunately, the compulsive behaviors don't really make the anxiety go away. They just provide very temporary relief and it becomes a, a vicious cycle. There's also so social anxiety, uh, social phobia, people are are anxious around uh, social interactions. Typically, they're um, anxious that people are going to judge them, anxious about being embarrassed or or um, humiliated. And generalized anxiety disorders just kind of like chronic worry about lots of different things, separation anxieties, uh, exactly what it sounds like, um, not wanting to be separated from from caregivers or uh, key people in your life. So what, what causes anxiety? Why do some people have severe anxiety and others don't? Well, sometimes it's in response to actual, you know, stressors or dangers that have occurred in your life. It could be that you had some sort of trauma, assault, or chronic um, condition that uh, caused you to be stressed for a long period of time and then develop a, excuse me, an anxiety disorder, race being um, a victim of racism. Uh, of course, the pandemic created a tremendous amount of stress for folks. Uh, there are medical conditions like hormonal conditions that can cause anxiety-like symptoms, um, medications or illicit drugs. And then, you know, anxiety disorders, many of them run in families. So there seems to be a genetic predisposition for some folks to, to get them. It doesn't mean that, that it's destiny. It just means that you might have a higher risk for developing one. Fortunately, they're, they're treatable. We'll get to that uh, uh, shortly. Um, I mentioned thoughts and worries. So this is the thought part of, of depression. Um, we think of them as, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training in addition to being a college admissions consultant, uh, which is why I love talking about mental health. Um, 
And uh, cognitive distortions um, or twisted thinking includes things like overestimating the likelihood of a negative event, event right? I'm going to fail this class. I'm not going to get into college. Uh, I'm never going to get a job. Kind of assuming the worst things that maybe could happen, but you feel like they're they're definitely going to happen when they might be relatively unlikely. Um, secondly, and this is really important too, folks tend to underestimate their ability to cope with the outcome if it did happen. So if you ask someone who's afraid, well, what if I fail this test? You know, um, you ask, well, what would you do if you did fail the test? Then what? And you help kind of walk someone through it. They can start to think about, well, I guess I'd go back to the instructor and ask if I can retake it. I guess I would try to figure out what I did wrong and try to do better on the next test. Um, maybe I would retake the class if I had to. So they, you know, if you think through it, you realize that you can cope with many negative outcomes, but People don't tend to kind of think that through when they're worried. It's just this loop of what if this happens? What if this happens? Not really having any sense of their own ability to cope if it did happen. So those are kind of two things that get targeted in treatment, um, having more realistic expectations and also kind of understand your own ability to cope with um, stressors. And then thirdly, people who are very anxious tend to be very uncomfortable with uncertainty. And unfortunately, uncertainty is unavoidable in life. You don't know for sure, are you going to get into that college? Are you going to get a good grade in that class? You can't know for sure with lots of things about the future. And people who are not anxious or don't suffer from anxiety disorders just live with that anxiety and realize, eh, I guess I'll figure it out when I get there. Or, you know, this is what I'll do if, if the worst happens, rather than just getting kind of focused or paralyzed with the uncertainty. So when people are anxious, we've talked about behaviors before, I mentioned that briefly. These are re reactions that are very common, but they're not very helpful. So uh, I'm just going to go through them briefly. I mentioned avoidance. Okay, so that could be like procrastination uh, or avoiding a person who makes you anxious, avoiding situations that make you anxious. Um, if it's a phobia, of course, you know, people, you know, if you're afraid of Snakes, maybe you try to not to go to the reptile house at the zoo. Um, avoidance creates temporary relief, but it doesn't make the anxiety get better in the long run. Addictive behaviors, um, that can be, you know, using substances, alcohol, drugs, could also be using, addictively using social media, um, addictively using addictive gaming, addictive uh, use of food or other behave, behaviors. Um, as a way to sort of soothe those feelings of anxiety, a kind of escape from the feelings. And common thread with a lot of these things is people are trying to get away from the anxiety. It's such an uncomfortable feeling. People want to do anything to make it better, take a drug to make the anxiety go away, run away from the situation that they associate with anxiety. Uh, checking, that kind of goes along with OCD, so I don't want to go into that uh, as, as just compulsions. So checking could be, you know, if you're worried about... Uh, your score on a test or worried about whether you're getting into a college. Maybe you're obsessively checking a website or a portal to see if, you, if you've gotten results yet. Uh, if you're anxious about your body, maybe you're obsessively checking to see if there's a pain or if there's something wrong with your body. Um, and then compulsions would be, you know, various kinds of rituals that people engage in to manage the anxiety. Often they're, um, they're very irrational and there's no logical connection to the the uh, target. So it could be like counting or tapping or something like that. So those are the unhealthy or not very helpful reactions. They, they don't really treat the anxiety. They just give you temporary relief. And often they create their own problems, right? If you use alcohol to manage your anxiety, you may end up with an alcohol addiction and then you, or substance abuse, and then you've got that problem to deal with on top of the anxiety you started with. So these are healthier alternatives, and there's so many of them, I've got two slides for them. First one is meditative practices. I don't just say meditation, but anything that brings that soothing, calming state of mind. That could be just slow, deep breathing. Um, and, uh, you know, I've taught many people how to do this, just taking slow, deep breaths. Uh, you, you, you can, you know, Google how to do deep breathing and, and find instructions and videos on how to do it. It's amazingly, you know, you can learn it quickly. It's very effective and it works pretty quickly within a few minutes. Um, unless your anxiety is at a very high level, in which case you may have to do something else to bring it down before you can sit down and do something soothing. 
Sometimes something a bit more active works if your anxiety level is high, like yoga, tai chi, because there's a little bit of movement involved. Um, so if you're more anxious, those might be a better fit. If you don't like just kind of sitting and breathing, that could be a better fit for you. For some people, prayer works too. Again, has that sort of rhythmic, meditative, repetitive quality, just like breathing and uh, and meditation. Lots of different meditation techniques. Um, whatever works for you is is fine, I think. Um, mindfulness. So people kind of associate mindfulness with meditation, but mindfulness is much bigger than meditation. Mindfulness means that you're in the moment, that you are attending to what is happening right now. Remember, with worries, they're all about what is going to happen in the future. What if this happens in the future? Wouldn't that be terrible? How would I cope? That would be awful. Um, if you're in the present, you can't be worrying about the future. So it's almost impossible to be anxious and mindful at the same time, which is why mindfulness is so effective. And uh, you can, sure, you can be mindful when you're breathing, noticing the sensation of your breath going in and out of your body. But you can also be mindful when you're taking a walk, just, you know, the sort of slow down and smell the roses. Uh, I take a walk almost every day and try to, you know, not be checking my phone, which is dangerous or spacing out, but, you know, looking around me, looking at the, you know, what's in bloom right now, what's the quality of the air, sound, sight, smell, sensations. You can be mindful when you're eating, noticing the taste and smell and texture and color of the food, for example. So you can be mindful, you know, through many activities throughout the day. Um, exercise, um, you know, kind of goes without saying, it's one of the most effective techniques for lots of um, mental health challenges. Um, getting out in nature is very soothing for many people. Uh, getting, you know, exposure to sunlight, if you have access to sunlight, uh, getting enough rest, you know, if, you, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to be more prone to anxiety. For some people, listening to music is very calming. Exactly what kind of music that, you know, depends on your preferences. Journaling, I think, is an interesting one that people often overlook. You know, we often think about, you know, talking to uh, a trusted um, confidant, trust talking to a therapist. But if you, you know, if it's the middle of the night and, and there's nobody you can talk to, you can always journal. You can always pull out a piece of paper or pull out your laptop, whatever, and just, just get your thoughts out on paper. What are you thinking, feeling? What are your worries? Just put it out there. And often kind of getting it outside of yourself and seeing the words is a little bit relaxing to see like, wow, I was really anxious. I was kind of overreacting, wasn't I? Um, so uh, doing that a, on a regular basis, many people find helpful. Reading, again, like music, you know, exactly what kind of reading uh, depends on what works for you. Um, having some sort of routine or structure uh, helps a lot of people remember Anxiety is often exacerbated by uncertainty and worrying about the unknown. So having something that you can count on, you know, at this time every day I exercise or I have a tea or a meal with, with someone that I care for. Uh, having things that are kind of built into your day or I journal at a specific time or read it or listen to music um, just can be can be comforting. And that's different from, from uh, rituals and compulsions, which I talked about earlier, which again, tend to be just sort of irrational and, and uh, don't give any lasting uh, benefit. Um, connection with others. So that's why I chose this picture. Um, connection obviously could be a physical connection. If you, if you do um, like to be hugged and have somebody in your life who hugs you, try going for a hug that lasts, not just the two second hug that of greeting someone, but Hanging in there for 10, 20, 30 seconds, you'll be amazed. If you let that hug last, you'll just feel your heart rate going down. You just have this ah oh, feeling like that feels good. Um, but of course, connection can be a virtual connection, um, can be uh, all kinds of connections with, with family, friends, coworkers. Um, loneliness and isolation is has just unfortunately got much worse during the pandemic and is a huge problem for mental health. So finding ways to connect with people is super important. Obviously, treatment, professional treatment. If all this other stuff doesn't work, there are professionals who can help you, and treatment is generally pretty effective for anxiety. I treated many, many people over the years when I was working as a therapist. Uh, I happen to, you know, like I mentioned, sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is addressing your thoughts, but DBT is dialectical behavior therapy, and that teaches uh, emotion regulation strategies, among others. So interesting approach. Medication, of course, 
Uh, medication is a tricky one because some of the medications that people traditionally used for anxiety can be habit forming um, and lose their effectiveness over time. Um, but some of them can be very helpful for, for panic disorder and uh, OCD and other conditions. And then there's other kinds of techniques that professionals use like biofeedback and neurofeedback where you have, you're hooked up to a machine that gives you feedback about things like your um, brain waves or uh, heart rate or um, skin conductance. And, and then you train yourself to calm down when you're hooked up to the machine. You wanna strive for the, what I call the zone. So if things are too easy or too familiar, you're at risk of getting bored, you know? Uh, imagine if you're if you're a high school student and you're taking a class that's way too easy for you. You know, if you have different levels of math to choose from, for example, and you take a level that's too easy, you're going to get bored, and that's stressful in itself. If you go to the other extreme and to, and it's too difficult, you're going to be stressed out because you don't understand the material and you're worried that you're going to fail. But if you find that middle zone where you're, it's just sort of on the edge of challenging you. It's a little bit unfamiliar. It's a little bit making you work it can be much more fulfilling and enjoyable and less stressful, of course, um, because you're you're getting the satisfaction of improving and learning. And that applies to lots of different things. So when should we kind of worry about people who have anxiety or other mental health issues? Well, hopelessness is, is kind of a red flag. If someone feels like there's no hope, then they are potentially at risk of becoming suicidal if they have no hope that things are gonna get better. Someone's talking about death or suicide a lot. Um, it, it is something that should be taken seriously. Um, if there is decreased functioning at school or work or in relationships or you know eating, sleeping, um, starting to isolate themselves in a way that's not normal for them. Um, mentioned of addictive and compulsive behaviors before. Again, that includes things like excessive gaming or or media use. And then, you know, any disturbance in their, their daily routine, uh, like sleep, energy level, and so on. If you're in a position to interact with students, if you're a student yourself, you can help other students. Here's some things you can do. First of all, you know, this is what they say in public transit. If you see something, say something, right? If you noticed um, someone in your circle, in your orbit, you're concerned about, speak up. Just just say, hey, you know, I've noticed you, you haven't been socializing as much lately, or you don't seem to be sleeping as well lately. Um, just want to check in on you. I was a little, little concerned about that. And just kind of give them space to talk. Um, in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the key habits is seek first to understand. I think it's actually from the Bible originally. Seek first to understand. So before you jump in with advice, if you're a parent, and I'm a parent too, so I totally get it. Before you jump in, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you go back on your medication? Why don't you exercise more? Why don't you, you know, before you start giving advice, try to understand, oh, you're really anxious about, about uh, school. T tell me more about that. What, you know, what are you so anxious about? When did that start? Um, uh, and then empathize. If the person opens up to you, then just kind of reflect back that you understand what they're saying. Okay, so I, I hear what you're saying. You're, you're really stressed out about this whole college application process. I get it. I can see why it's a lot of work. There's a lot of uncertainty. That makes a lot of sense to me. Just showing that you understand. Normalize. That means, you know, reflect back that this is totally normal. Hey, other students get stressed about out about this too. This is, you know, very common to have these feelings. So it's okay. It's normal. Um, you don't want the person to be getting down on the sims. Why am I feeling this way? What's wrong with me? You want people to understand that that that's okay and that's normal to have these feelings. You also want to empower, right? And so, you know, I mentioned before, don't jump in with advice, which is very natural as a parent to want to do, or or helping professional or teacher or counselor. Try to empower the student or the other person to solve the problems themselves and mm -hmm. and grow themselves. So, you know, wow. So I understand that you're struggling with this. You you know you. You're not doing so well in this class, and that worries you. Hmm. What have you have? What have you come up with? What ideas do you have about how you might address this? What are your thoughts? Do you have some ideas about what you might want to do about it? Let them come up with ideas. Encourage them. Show that you have confidence that they they've solved problems before, and that maybe they'll be able to solve this one too. You know, I know you had some some issues before, and you got through them. 
what worked for you before. Uh, and it's this kind of encouraging the growth mindset that you can encounter challenges and grow and change. And it's not like this is all it's ever going to be. Uh, the fixed mindset is is not good for one's mental health, the notion that, you know, this is it. I'm just, you know, I'm a failure or whatever it might be. And then be a role model, you know, and that includes opening up about your own feelings, showing healthy behaviors yourself. Well, you know, I find that exercising helps me manage my moods. So, you know, I do that regularly. I found that it's super important for me to get enough sleep. So you can see, you know, I'm going to go to bed soon because, you know, I don't want to be exhausted and stressed out tomorrow. So being a role model um, helps too. Uh, it's not all about telling someone what to do, but kind of showing that, that you might have struggled with feelings of stress and anxiety, and this is what you come up with to uh, solve them yourself. Um, if you are the person with anxiety, uh, if you're a student who has anxiety, um, these are th some things to consider. In addition to everything else I've already said, one is, you know, face your feelings. Don't run away from them. It's just a feeling. It's not going to kill you. Um, acknowledge to yourself that, yeah, I am, this does actually stress me out. This, I am really worried. Um, and that's okay. I'm a human being. I have feelings. I can have this feeling. And as much as I don't like it, I can live with it. I've had anxiety before. Everybody gets anxious sometimes. It isn't something I have to immediately solve or get rid of. I can just kind of surf or cruise through it. Um, change, realize that change is normal. Uh, it's the one thing you can count on is things keep changing. So you may not like it, but it's the reality. Um, we all grow and mature and adapt and develop. And, you know, some of that may be desirable, some not always. Um, but fighting it isn't going to help. So accepting that, yeah, things change. Okay, going to college is going to be different from high school. And and I'll I'll have to figure that out. Fortunately, there's a lot of, you know, people out there who can help me figure it out. Staying connected with others, I talked about that already. Um, you know, whoever has been a positive influence, a positive role model in your life, those are the people to keep in your life, the friends who are good for you, friends who have, you know, gotten you into trouble or made you feel worse, made you feel bad about yourself, maybe not so much. Um, developing a structure, we talked about that already, staying on track, don't, you know, don't let these feelings throw you uh, just kind of give up and stop doing your schoolwork because if you fall behind, you're going to get even more stressed out. So find a way to stay on track with things with the college application process, even if you're struggling so that you don't regret it later and think, oh, I wish I had gotten my applications in. I wish I had studied for this test. Notice what works. Um, again, kind of touched on that before. Um, what's been useful for you before? Did listening to music help you before? Did hanging out with your pet help you before? Did hanging out with your friends, uh, talking to your parents help you before? Use the strategies that have worked in the past. This is probably not the first time in your life you've been anxious. So what helped you get through it in the past? And finally, savor your successes. So it's, it's easy to kind of breeze through the successes and focus on the things that you're struggling with or that you're worried about. But when something goes well, pause and give yourself credit for it. So if that test that you worried about actually went okay, say, hey, good for me. You know, I studied like I needed to. It was tough. I was stressed out about it, but I actually did okay. Um, maybe I'm, you know, more capable than I gave myself credit for. So pause and just kind of breathe and drink in that success. Um, when you get to college or university, if you prefer the term, um, don't hesitate to get help there. Before you start college, research research in advance, where can I get help? Um, in the US, most colleges these days have a mental health counseling service. Often there's a number of free mental health counseling sessions available to all students at no charge. Um, that's redundant. Um, so, uh, but you know, those counseling staff may be overworked. There may be a limit to how many sessions you can access. So, think beyond the counseling center. Think about all the resources that might be out there. For example, some colleges have something called living learning communities. Some of those might be kind of wellness oriented, um, substance free, people who are focused on yoga, meditation, exercise. Um, so look for those communities of people who are trying to stay healthy and well. Look for the clubs on campus. Active Minds is a national um, chain of clubs on college campuses that's focused on mental health, but there may be also peer support groups. 
uh, or JED certified campuses, um, which also have, you know, mental health um, strengths as a campus. And um, if there isn't a club that's good that, along these lines at your college, you can start one. Um, I'm sure you're not the only student struggling. So I'm sure other students would love to get together and support each other. There are going to be mentors, tutors, RAs in the residence hall, faculty, advisors, coaches. There's so many people who can be there for you. Find those adults, professionals, staff, or you know, even older students who are good supports and don't hesitate to lean on them. If they happen to be the counseling and the counseling center, great. If it happens to just be one of your professors, that's okay too. Sometimes you need to seek out um, professional assistance outside the campus, like individual or group therapy, medications, or even you know primary care doctors. Uh, in, in the US, most psychiatric medications or psychotropic medications are actually not prescribed by psychiatric professionals. They're prescribed by primary care professionals, like doctors and nurses, uh, internists, um, family medicine doctors. So. Um, it may be the primary doctor, your pediatrician or family medicine doctor who, who's a, a good support. Um, where do you get referrals? Um, some of this may be specific to the US, you know, go to your primary doctor and get a referral. Uh, they may be able to prescribe medication or suggest someone who can. If you're in high school, go to your school counselor. They can not only counsel you, but they can also suggest resources in the community. Um, if you're if you're an, um, an employee or your parents are employees of a company, there's a very good chance that they have a benefit called an employee assistance program or an EAP. I worked in the EAP field for 10 plus years, so I know a lot about these. Um, and you're often entitled to free um, short-term counseling, not just for the employee like your parent, but typically for dependents, family members who live with them. So uh, that could be a benefit that that's easy to overlook that, that people who are employees sometimes forget about. Health plans, call up your insurance plan or go online and look at the benefits. There's often a, a directory of providers who takes your insurance. The American Psychological Association has a online locator for psychologists and Psychology Today, it's a commercial paid uh, therapist directory, but it's the biggest one of its kind. So it's a good place to find some, especially if you're looking for particular specialties, you can put in filters, like I need somebody who takes this insurance and works with this age group and treats this specific problem. You can find people who meet that description. On the topcollegeconsultants.com website, got lots of uh, resources. You can find all these things. Um, another one you can find that I didn't put up here is our list of neurodiversity friendly colleges and universities. So if you're looking for colleges with support programs, uh, learning support, academic uh, autism support programs, we've got a whole list of them on the website, a database which you can search by uh, sort by state. Um, and then these various webinars, podcasts, et cetera, you can find all these links on our website, topcollegeconsultants.com. Of course, you can reach out to us if you're looking for help with college admissions um, and applications. Um, and what are the takeaways here? You know, think about if you're ready emotionally for, for college and uh, think about what skills you need to work on in high school and develop a support program so that when you start college, if you run into those challenges, you know where the supports and services are. Thank you so much for attending. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the event.